before I start today's review, I want you guys to listen for something as you watch this video. I know in some of my more recent reviews, I talk slower and the review as a whole has a very sluggish pace because of that. This was especially apparent to me when I watched my Toho Sky Arena review. So with this review, I tried talking a little faster to get rid of those pacing issues. I won't postpone the review any further. Just let me know in the comments whether you like or dislike this change. Without further ado, here is my review of the Nintendo Switch exclusive air combat game, Sky Gambler's Afterburner. The story of Afterburner puts you in the shoes of DICE, part of a special force of pilots known as the Sky Gamblers. When a naval exercise turns into a drone-based terrorist attack, the Sky Gamblers are sent after the organization involved to find out who they are and take them down before they can disrupt the world order. Now I'll admit, the story of this game really, really tries to drag you into characters with a lot of development and even has a little love story written into it in the later chapters. The only problem here is the fact that the game is so short you don't have enough time to get to know these characters before all of these big emotional payoff events happen. So when they do happen, you don't really feel that much from it. It's like an emotional payoff event for someone you're supposed to know a lot more than you actually do. Now, when it comes to gameplay, Afterburner is a 3D air combat game like pretty much everything else in the genre, from Ace Combat to the other Sky Gamblers games. You're going to be flying through 3D arenas and fighting off enemy units both in the air and on the ground. And of course, the biggest thing here is unlike all of the other Sky Gamblers games, this is not a port from a mobile platform. This is a completely new game, completely separate from the other games that was constructed specifically for the Nintendo Switch. Now when it comes to game modes, you do have a few things you can go through. In single player, you can go through the game's tutorial, the 15 mission story campaign, and make custom matches against the AI in 8 different game modes from actual air to air combat free for alls to the more casual free roam games that let you just enjoy and explore the scenery. Outside of single player, you've got multiplayer where you can go into online lobbies and fight against other players from around the world. Then you've got the shop where you can use in-game currency to buy new planes and customize that lets you customize your planes in a lot of different ways. From changing upgrades and weapons all the way to putting in custom vinyl paint jobs on all of the planes that you own. This isn't like Need for Speed or Gran Turismo's decal editor where you can make pretty much anything you want, but you do have a lot of options here to make your planes look very unique. Of course, the biggest game mode here is the story campaign, and that's very unfortunate because the story campaign is very, very short. You've got 15 story missions to go through, and I'd completed all of them in a little over two hours, two and a half hours. It really wasn't that long before I'd completely cleared the game, and all that was left for me to do is multiplayer and grinding missions to keep buying new planes. But outside of that, let's talk about the actual gameplay in combat because there are a lot of unique things here. You've got your normal controls where you can speed up, slow down, move in all directions, switch weapons, fire off your machine gun and special missiles. But there are some things here that I haven't seen in other games like this. First of all, the D-pad is used for cinematic aerial evasion moves, like sliding to the left or right or doing a Star Fox style U-turn. This makes it much easier to dodge incoming missiles, especially when you've got a lot of different planes shooting at you all at once. And the other is more for looks, but it's a little detail I really like, which is the eject feature. When your plane is at critical damage, you can hit the B button to actually eject from your plane, and you can actually see your player flying through the air. Like I said, it's more of a looks thing, but it's a really interesting little detail that I haven't seen in very many other games. When it comes to combat, it is very fluid. You're flying with your team of other pilots, and you always fly in formation and attack together. When you lock onto an enemy unit and start firing your missiles, your three companions will start firing their missiles, making your three or four missiles into about 10 or 12 that completely overwhelms and decimates the target, not to mention letting you conserve ammo for later on in the mission. I really love how this works because you've got AI that's actually smart that helps you, instead of AI I've seen in other flying games that are just kind of there. Now all of this comes together pretty well, but as you'd expect from what I said before, this is not a very long game. The story campaign barely lasts two and a half hours, and anything else you do is either diving into multiplayer or grinding missions to be able to buy more planes. Doing the latter will definitely give you a little more time, but overall, it's very, very short for the asking price of $20. Now let's talk about controls for just a second because of how the motion controls are turned on and off. When you go into settings, you see an option that says accelerometer. This is actually the toggle to turn motion controls on or off. 
It's labeled like this, which confused me, because the game doesn't actually use the Nintendo Switch's gyro controls, it just uses the Joy-Con's accelerometer to dictate motion. As long as you know what it does, there's no problem. But I spent about an hour playing the game not understanding why I couldn't turn motion controls off because I accidentally turned this feature on when I booted up the game, thinking it was part of the HUD, not realizing it was actually the motion controls. Now let's get into presentation, which is mostly good. Graphically, the game looks really nice. There's a ton of detail in the planes and definitely the most detailed environments in any handheld air combat games. Every single map has landmarks, tons and tons of buildings that you can fly around. All in all, it's just really, really detailed, even down to the iconic statue in Rio. Music, however, isn't so great about the game mostly with the fact that most missions don't have any background music at all, despite the fact that the main menu has some really good music tracks to it. And with performance, I mostly have good things to say. Frame rate is nice and steady. The only problem is the fact that load times are a bit on the longer side. And with that out of the way, let's get into battery life. Very similar to the range for Storm Raiders, Sky Gambler's Afterburner has a battery range of three hours and three minutes on high settings, up to three hours and 34 minutes on low settings. Now I think this is pretty decent, especially since you can clear the entire campaign on a single charge here. Now in conclusion, Afterburner is one of the first games to introduce modern planes to the Nintendo Switch, and it's even a console exclusive. Now on the downside, the campaign is very short and it suffers from some long load times and strange setting choices. It's a very fun game and has really fluid and fun gameplay, but it's probably best you buy it on sale instead of for the full $20. Reviews to go rate Sky Gambler's Afterburner for the Nintendo Switch a 7 out of 10. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to leave them below or head to the website at reviewstogo.com.